Good morning. Let's start um, with, I can't believe it's our closing lecture already. It's been a pleasure to be here and to have all of you around. I am honored to present Professor David James. He's an eminent geneticist and research director of the Institute of Healthy Aging at the University College of London. He has been using C. elegans to understand the fundamental mechanisms that cause the aging process, including late life disease over the last 40 years. He graduated from Sussex University at 1983 and obtained his PhD at Glasgow University in 1990. After that, he began working on the biology of aging in C. elegans with Professor Dot Riddle. Later, he set up his own research group at the University College of London with the support of a fellowship from the Royal Society. He's a founder member of the Institute of Healthy Aging and has contributed to, the, to an important number of articles to the field. In the past few days, I had the opportunity to chat with David, and I was happily surprised to hear that he lived in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Mexico. Indeed, he was an English teacher in Mexico City when he was traveling in the area. David, we really appreciate that you accept our invitation to give this closing lecture of this meeting. We hope you are enjoying coming back to Latin America. Please, let's give a warm welcome to David. Thank you. Um, hola, buenos días a todos. Uh, ¿se, ¿Se puede oírme? Um, ok. Um, gracias, uh, Rosa, y muchas gracias um, to, to, the, um, to all, the, all the meeting uh, organizing team for inviting me all the way over from London, where it's cold and, and, and sleet. So it's wonderful to come here, and it's been an excellent meeting, and I've learned a great deal. Um, in particular, um, something I really didn't know, which was that Valparaiso is, I, I think, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's an absolutely amazing city, really. Um, right, so let's get started. Uh, you see the new clicker. Right, so I'm going to talk um, initially, I'll sort of introduce the topic um, uh, with the subject of death um, and what causes death. Why, why do people die? Um, and in a way, a nice way to end the meeting with something like this, since we'll all die. Um, so um, there are different causes of death, and some uh, causes of death are very much in the news. For example, um, the coronavirus now fading away. In Europe, we have a new cause of death uh, called Vladimir Putin. Um, but actually, for most of us uh, here today, th these are the things that we're, we will uh, die from. So uh, what this shows, this plot here, uh, are all the various major causes of death uh, in Western populations. And the size of the circle is how many people die from those causes. So we've got um, cardiovascular disease here, the yellow one, cancer here, respiratory disorder. So that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So most of us here will die from uh, one or a combination of these things. And then we've got nervous system disorders that would include things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and so on. And then all the way down through through the, the minor causes, uh, right down to the very top there, war and terrorism at the top there. So um, in fact, there's really one main cause of most of, of, uh, of this death, um, which is the, uh, the aging process. So aging is a biological process which now is the main cause of disease in the world. So the process of aging causes cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, osteoarthritis, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and um, the odd thing is, is that despite, you know, a century of, of, of fantastic biology, uh, we still don't really understand what aging is, um, which is you know, really bad. We need to understand the process of aging to understand, you know, what actually causes Alzheimer's. Why do, why do people develop osteoarthritis? We have to answer this question to answer those questions. Um, so why has it been so difficult? Uh, why has, in a way, biology failed to answer this question? Um, and I think the reason is just it's very complicated. Aging is a very complicated process. 
Um, so when faced with very complex uh, biological questions, you know, C. elegans, this is a great job for, for an organism like C. elegans, simple animal model. Um, and so the idea then would be if we could if we could understand aging in a fundamental sense so that we could say, you know, what actually is aging in C. elegans, then that would enable us, it would give us, um, set us on the right path uh, to understanding uh, aging in an organism that re actually matters really. Um, uh, not that Celia's doesn't matter, but in a way, it, it Celia's doesn't really matter. It's just a very ordinary nematode. Um, so the research on the, on the biology of um, of aging C. elegans is very much focused on the use of genetics, kind of standard classical genetics. Um, and this is an approach that's been used in developmental biology, in neurobiology, many other aspects of biology to understand how genes control traits. So, you know, you start by identifying mutants with altered lifespan, or altered aging. And if you can do that, then uh, it should be relatively trivial to find the genes that control aging, find the proteins that, that they encode. And that should lead to uh, the identification of biological processes that control aging and that, which should explain aging. Um, and actually, no, people didn't believe that you could do this until uh, the late 80s, thanks to work from particularly Michael Klass and Tom Johnson uh, and then Cynthia Kenyon, uh, who discovered you could actually isolate long-lived mutants. So here we have uh, an example of a long-lived mutant. Here we've got the survival percentage on the y-axis and the uh, the age and the x-axis. Here's a normal worm population, wild-type population, and here's a population where the lifespan is doubled. Uh, and this is a, a mutation in, in the gene DAF2. And this is from Cynthia Kenyon in 1993. Um, and um, I, I can't emphasize enough what an incredible result this is. I mean, it's, it's, it's jaw-dropping. The implications are enormous. Um, so in a, there are two particular implications. So the first is, is that um, what this implies is that there must exist some core central mechanisms of aging which are which precede all of the diseases of aging so all these things that that, that um thousands of, of scientists try to understand these different different diseases of aging they're all arising from some upstream uh process of aging um which controls all of them so if you could understand this and if you could intervene in aging in the way that this mutation has done then i mean you have the prospect of of, of treatments that would prevent the whole spectrum of diseases of aging. It's, it's incredible. But not only that, but this discovery is in, is in C. elegans, which is a famously easy, tractable organism to work with. You know, and uh, when I came across this work, um, actually the slightly earlier work from Tom Johnson initially, I just thought, you know, wow, that is amazing. And I thought this is something worth you know, dedicating my research to, you know, I was, uh, I was young then. And I thought this is, this is a question really worth trying to solve. It's, it's just incredible. Um, so, um, so I moved, uh, and, you know, in terms of how difficult it would be, my thinking was, you know, five years, 10 years, right, to solve that. It can't be that difficult. You find the genes, you, uh, you find out what they do and you solve aging. So I was very excited. I moved from London to, uh, to Missouri uh, to the lab of, uh, of Don Riddle, there he is, um, and uh, you know, it's a long time ago. Uh, five years, it certainly wasn't. Just to sort of put it in perspective, you know, this was this was early in the in the uh, this was early in the presidency of Carl Menem, and, and it was actually the year of the birth of Ariana Grande. So, uh, but you know, things initially moved really fast. Um, and Cecilia introduced this very nicely. This is the, uh, the insulin IGF pathway. I've simplified it here. Um, so, uh, you know, what happened in the late 90s, the, the uh, Gary Rufkin's lab uh, in particular uh, cloned and sequenced a lot of the genes that were having these large effects on aging. I identified this insulin IGF signaling pathway. And, you know, it's a, it's a pathway that humans have. Um, and then uh, when I moved back to London, one of the things that I was involved in was looking at the... Um, the role of this pathway in controlling aging in other organisms, particularly the fruit fly that's worked with Linda Partridge and the mouse with Dominic Withers. Um, and the research showed that if you, you, you mutate the pathway in flies and mice, you get the extension of lifespan. You know, this was 
fantastic. It's, it's evolutionarily conserved. It's a universal aging pathway. Um, and this, this sort of was coming into about 2002, 2003. Um, but I would say that from about that time, things kind of slowed down in terms of, not in terms of beautiful work that people did. You know, there've been, you know, thousands of papers published on this by now in C. elegans. But the question fundamentally is, you know, so what is the aging process? How do we go from here to understanding what's the cause of um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, right? Where's our general understanding of aging? Uh, we don't have it. And about 10 years ago, having worked on this for 20 years, you know, I began to realize this field isn't going anywhere. We're not getting anywhere. This, in fact, this, this goal, you know, it was sort of like El Dorado, you know, you, pe people just started to not believe in it anymore, you know. And these genes were like 20 years ago so that th these genes have been sequenced. And we still don't know really particularly what DAS16 is regulating uh, that actually controls it. We know it controls lots of genes, but we don't know how that uh, translates into effects on lifespan. So I came to the conclusion as sort of like a in, a in a kind of crisis where I thought what we've learned is that the methods that we're using, the, uh, pre the assumptions that we've got, must be wrong. They must be wrong. They're inadequate somehow. We need something else. And so um, for the last 10 years, I've essentially been trying to, in a way, think out of the box, to try to do things completely differently, to try to get out of what I think, to my mind, is a rut. I know that's probably not a nice thing to say, uh, you know, in terms of people working in the field, but I just think that's that's how it is. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about. New work, and some, some of it is, is very out of the box. So uh, first of all, new experimental approaches. Um, so this is a, an experimental approach that we have developed in the lab over the years. And it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of way of thinking differently about how to study aging in C. elegans. So here's our problem. Uh, we've, we've got, we know we've, these genes that regulate aging. We know something about effector genes, but we've no idea how they're actually affecting the time of, uh, of death. So we have a, a causal chain between this and this, and we don't know what lies in between. This is the big mystery gap. Um, so here's what I propose. This is, this is a sort of a, a hypothesis about this, and I don't think this is a crazy hypothesis by any means. So the hypothesis is that old C. elegans, they die because they are ill. They have illnesses, they have diseases like we do. We don't die of nothing. We die when we get old because we have diseases. And these diseases arise from senescent pathologies, things that are changing within, within tissues. Um, and those pathologies arise from pathogenetic mechanisms, some, some driving mechanisms that, that cause these pathologies to develop. Um, so we know lots about this and uh, we have masses of information, but here we really have very little information. Uh, on this. There's very little knowledge about what diseases C. elegans gets and, and how they uh, cause aging, so how they cause death. So we have a number of questions. Um, we have the question of, um, of what these mechanisms are, what are the pathologies that lead to life-limiting disease, uh, and the question here is which diseases do actually worms die from? And then we've got actually death itself, the process of death in the worm, and what's actually happening there. Um, so, uh, yeah, right. So uh, I think of all of these questions, that's the key. That's the key question. What are these mechanisms? That's the key to understanding aging. So we call this a pathology-centered approach, as opposed to what I would say the, the, the general approach before has been a lifespan, more of a lifespan-centered approach, or now a little bit health span. And uh, one important idea here as well, this is uh, kind of a, let's say, let's call it a working hypothesis is that the principles, the general principles of senescent pathophysiology here are likely to be general to all animals. Okay, so that's a sort of idea that we explore. So they're evolutionarily conserved. So if we understand how sort of these obscure diseases of aging in worms, how what their mechanisms are that create them, they'll be basically the same principles involved as those that cause whatever, osteoarthritis. So that's... Um, that's the uh, approach. So what have we got next now? Right. So I thought before I get to the main topic, I was going to say a little bit, very quickly, 
about the questions of what worms die of and, and the nature of death in worms. These are very unexplored areas. Years ago, in, in, um, when I was still in Missouri, George Williams, who's a fantastic uh, evolutionary biologist, he visited and he asked me, you know, what, what do the old worms die of? You know? And it, it took me many years to realize what a great question this was. Um, and uh, to work on it with an a, a absolutely great postdoc called Yuan Zhao, there she is there. Um, and so what, what Yuan did was to, to try to figure out what worms die of. She just looked at the corpses. Uh, so this is uh, necropsy. Uh, and in fact, it's surprising how well preserved the corpses are if you look at them fresh. And one thing she noticed was very striking. So here's the pharynx. Um, so this is a, an older worm. You can see the size of the pharynx. She noticed in the corpses that sometimes they died with a big pharynx uh, full of bacteria. Uh, and sometimes they died with a small pharynx, an atrophied pharynx. Um, and we call these big P deaths because it's a uh, um, big pharynx and, and small P. And the big P deaths happened before the small P deaths. So what Yuan was able to do was to actually deconvolve uh, the the uh, the aging populations into two subpopulations. So here in black is the whole population. Here are the small p deaths, and here are the big p deaths. So for all these years, when you people studying lifespan in C. elegans, uh, at least on live E. coli, they're actually looking at two completely different populations in terms of what how they die. Um, and this is this uh, opens up a whole sort of uh, a whole new way of of using survival data. Uh, it, by combining it with necropsy data. Um, and what, what, what in fact happens is that, um, is that interventions affecting lifespan, sometimes they will only affect the big P population and sometimes only the small P population. And they also can affect the frequency of the big P and small P death. So uh, it, it, in, in some of the strange shapes that one sees in survival curves in worms, you can actually make sense of them in terms of differential effects on big P and small P death. Uh, yeah, okay, so th this is sort of going off slightly at a tangent, uh, and it kind of breaks the flow a bit, but I, um, uh, Natalie Pujol twisted my arm to include this, so I, I have here. But this is more work from the wonderful, this is another study from this amazing um, Yuan Zhao. Um, so this is a sort of warning to people working on aging, um, a, a sort of health warning. Now, the CGC, the Senior Abditis Genetics Center, they used to distribute two different N2 wild-type stocks, there was the usual one that were the hermaphrodites only, um, uh, but they also distributed a, a, a male stock. And what I discovered actually many years ago is that the lifespans are different of these two, uh, su suggesting that one of them's a mutant. And in fact, um, Yuan actually worked it out. She, she found that the, it's actually the male stock, which is a mutant, um, and it has a mutation in a gene called Flynn 2. Um, so uh, in fact, many strains, um, actually carry this Flynn 2 mutation. So if you're doing any lifespan genetics, you would be well advised to check, get this paper and check the, the, the genotype in terms of Flynn 2. So there's a little bit of the data from that. So this now is the percentage of worms dying with the big P, okay? So if you have more big P deaths, that's gonna shorten your lifespan because they die sooner. So here's the N2H, the hermaphrodite stock, here's the male stock. This, light, this strain here is N2H, which has had the, uh, the Flynn, this Flynn 2 mutation crispered in, and that's um, that's what they look like in terms of the lifespans. Okay, so you see, it's a, there's a there's a difference. It's not huge, but it's it's enough to mess up your experiments if if you've got some Flynn 2 plus and some Flynn 2 mutant lines. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, right. So coming back to the sort of flow of things, uh, I talked about causes of death, but what about death itself? Um, a huge interest in cell death. Right, the mechanisms of cell death is a huge topic, but what about organismal death? There's almost no study of this, and organismal death is actually really interesting. Um, so this is a, a study uh, from a, a guy who worked in my lab called Yevgeny Galimov, um, which showed that um, when worms die, they undergo a process quite uh, it's that uh, is apparently uh, the equivalent process to rigor mortis in humans. So this is uh, in, in across all vertebrates. So it's, um, it's an example of showing how you have conservation of, 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 uh, of mechanisms uh, causing, uh, in this case, organismal death. Um, so what actually happens is that uh, rigor mortis, you, the, the, the muscles run out of ATP, 
uh, and then the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium, and then you get hypercontraction. So this is a, a, a very much schematized here. Uh, and what happens, interesting, the, the, um, the, you get hypercontraction that starts in the head, which pulls the pharynx back, so it crashes into the intestine. Um, and then you have a wave propagated along the worm. Um, and um, rigor mortis is actually closely related to the process of cellular necrosis, uh, where you have calcium influx leading to proteolysis and cell death. And this actually, this uh, rigor mortis uh, it triggers and is coupled to a second wave, so these are anterior posterior waves of cell death in the intestine. And that you can actually visualize um, because there's, um, there's a, uh, a naturally occurring fluorescent substance in the intestine. And if you shine UV light, you can see blue fluorescence appearing uh, in the intestine, like a bright blue fluorescence. And so this propagates anterior to posterior. And in the end, the, as the worm dies with, with the completely necrotic and completely blue fluorescent um, uh, intestine. It's actually a, a really cool thing to watch when the worms are dying, because you can actually see death passing through the worm in, in terms of this death fluorescence. Um, and uh, incidentally, and this is sort of this is a slight segue to what's coming. Um, it was thought that for a long, long time, it was as thought and then assumed that this blue fluorescence emanates from a molecular damage product called lipofuscin. Uh, and we were able to show some years ago that, in fact, it isn't lipofuscin at all. It's, in fact, a, um, a derivative of tryptophan called uh, anthranilate um, produced by the, um, the kynurenin pathway. All right, so that's that's enough about that. So now we come to the sort of the meat of the of the talk. Uh, so I'm I'm going to kind of not talk about worms for a few slides. I'm going to talk about theory because the question is if you know, do we have any idea what we're looking for? Are there aren't there theories of aging? Are generally you know, um, and in fact theories of aging have guided research to find out what you know the insulin pathway is regulating, um, and for about fifty years there has been a sort of general belief about aging, which has led to a, a range of different theories of aging that share the same basic idea, which is as follows. Um, and I sometimes call this the damage maintenance paradigm. So the idea is, um, you know, you, you end development uh, in a youthful state, and then with the passage of time, you accumulate molecular damage and you arise in a senescent and aged uh, deteriorated state. Um, but the good news is that the rate of damage accumulation uh, is to some extent under the control of the genome uh, through somatic maintenance, right? You can detoxify the causes of damage, you can repair damage, you can replace damaged parts. Um, and now I'm gonna kind of accelerate through a whole lot of work without really talking about it. But I spent about 10 years testing one of the main damage theories called the, uh, the oxidative damage theory. And, and it, it is simply not true in C. elegans. And I, I, I think that there's really a question about how important uh, this sort of random damage accumulation really is as a major cause of aging. I think this, this, um, this is a theory, a paradigm, which has kind of gone into crisis, I would say. Certainly the, the oxidative damage theory barely ever mentioned anymore in aging meetings. In the 90s, it was constantly there in, in aging meetings. So let, let's look now at alternatives. So here we come to some new theories. Um, and this brings us back to George Williams, who was an evolutionary biologist, who came up with a, a theory which is almost without doubt true, which is an evolutionary theory called the antagonistic pyotropic theory. So this argues that aging evolves as a side effect of natural selection in favor of, of alleles, we should really say, that cause a benefit during youth. And that's because the force of selection gets lower in later life. Um, so, um, so what this actually tells us, what the, it, it does tell us something or make a major prediction about causes of aging, which is that it's actually the action of wild type genes is a major cause because of the fact that they've evolved and they do, they bring you into the world and they kind of take you out again, essentially. Um, and you know, DAF2 is a beautiful example of this principle. Right? The wild type DAF2 gene, remember, shortens life dramatically, and yet it also promotes fitness. Uh, it promotes development, for example. Um, so, um, so now we come to, in a way, what I would say is a sort of front line of, 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 of aging, where the real mystery is. Because the antagonistic pyotropy theory, we can, I think, say with confidence that this is correct. 
But it doesn't tell you still, it tells you that genes, because of antagonistic pleiotropia, are causing aging, but it doesn't tell you how. It doesn't tell you about the proximate mechanisms. Um, now, for many years, uh, there was a theory about this that, again, dominated the uh, aging field, um, which was put forward by uh, an English guy called Tom Kirkwood. And this theory assumed that aging is caused by damage, um, but it also um, um, uh, um, kind of observed or, or kind of deduced that somatic maintenance is costly in resource terms. And so um, what natural selection does, given that resources are often limiting in the wild, is to invest just enough resources into maintenance to keep you alive during reproduction. And all of the remainder remaining uh, resources go, uh, go into reproduction. And that actually is the way to maximize fitness. Because evolutionary fitness doesn't mean living as long as you can. It's the bottom line is how many offspring you have. So uh, the consequence of this is, you know, living organisms are a bit like cheap disposable uh, consumer products. You know, they're not they're not sort of manufactured to last, uh, and that's an evolutionarily uh, winning strategy. Um, so if the um, damage maintenance paradigm, if if the damage model is is not right, then the disposable soma theory isn't right either. And in fact. Uh, there have been quite a lot of experimental attempts to, to sort of to prove the theory, and it really just isn't well supported. So I think it's it's safe to to ab abandon this theory. Um, but it was something, as I say, that occupied minds for many many years, and it's still very much often present in in um, descriptions of explanations of data in, in aging papers. But now here's a new here's a new theory. This has emerged um, since the middle of the noughties, really and actually originates from Williams. Um, Williams didn't really concern himself with how antagonistic pleiotropy worked, but he did come up with one kind of uh, guess, if you like. It was his idea about maybe how it would work. So he imagined a gene, like a structural gene, that, that caused calcium deposition, and you have a new variant, like a gain of function, and what that does is to make calcium go into bone quicker. Uh, so the bones grow quicker, uh, and then if you're perhaps a gazelle in Africa, uh, you can run away from, from the predators because your bones grow quicker. But in later life, that same new allele causes a problem. It actually drives calcium into arteries and causes cardiovascular disease. So this is different to disposable soma. In this case, the gene is actively making the pathology happen. Right. It's 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 like a it's not just like the body wears out or deteriorates or gets damaged. The genes are making it happen. And this idea was um, picked up on uh, uh, by a guy called Misha Blagosklony and actually another uh, uh, person at the same time, Pedro de Magales, both came up with essentially the same theory, which was to use this uh, Williams's principle to make sense of how these pathways that have been found, like the the uh, insulinizer signaling pathway uh, and other growth promoting pathways, how they're causing aging. Um, so the argument here is that rather than thinking about single structural genes as Williams did, you can think in terms of regulatory genes controlling entire complex programs. Um, and then those programs actually then um, will continue on in later life in a similar fashion to here uh, and, call, and create what uh, Blagosklony called quasi programs. Um, which drive the development of pathology. So quasi program it's because they're genetically programmed, but they're not programmed in the sense of being an adaptation. Because aging is, from the evolutionary theory, it's not an adaptation, it's just a byproduct. So hence quasi program. So you can't say aging is programmed, right? Because that's, that's, that's a no-no, theoretically. But you can say it's quasi programmed or that it's programmatic in origin. So Misha is very much um, rather polemically sort of argued against the damage theory, which he sees as sort of having a kind of mind lock on biogerontology. So saying, look, just try and think of something else for once. And he's saying it's actually not a passive loss of function type of process at all. It's the opposite. It's actually something that's being driven. Uh, it's not loss of gene function. It's actually like, as he put it, hyperfunction. And this theory is sometimes called the hyperfunction theory, sometimes the developmental theory. I, I call it the programmatic theory. Um, so quasi-program, OK, this is non-adaptive run-on of, of developmental programs. And that includes adult developmental programs, like, for example, reproductive programs in females. 
uh, wound healing and so on. Um, and it's very elegant because these pathways, like the insulin ledger signaling tour pathways, they drive uh, uh, the program. They they drive development forward. So and and they divide they drive programs forward, and they also drive quasi programs forward. So it sort of would make sense on how they can affect so many different aging pathologies as they do. So I think historically, I, I found this sort of fascinating to think about, um, you know, how the story has changed over the years because around about 2000 we knew that um, we'd found the genes that were having big effects on lifespan across you know, worms to mice. Uh, and we knew that growth hormone, insulin-like growth factor, mTOR, which is a, uh, promotes growth, that these were all promoting aging. Um, but we also knew that there were some effects of these pathways on somatic maintenance. So what people thought at the time, they said, well, growth and development's nothing to do with aging. Aging is caused by damage. So therefore, it must be working through somatic maintenance. So the clue was there, like a screaming clue, growth. They didn't see it. But with Blagosclony and Dumagales, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the growth part that's actually driving the pathology. The, the somatic maintenance may play a, a, a role, but probably a minor role. So I think in a way, it's an interesting example of how your preconceptions um, uh, about you know, how things function mean that even when the clues are, are put right in front of you that your your preconceptions they're like a, like blinkers on a horse they they prevent you from being able to uh, to see what what the what the data is telling you so now we come back to the worms and again jumping over a lot of work this is data over the last decade we've been testing this theory in the worm and i spent 10 years testing the the oxid damage theory and getting negative results horrible trying to publish all these negative result papers as soon as I switched to use it, looking at the programmatic theory, fabulous! It's fantastic. You can you can show for lots of different diseases um, how uh, how programmatic mechanisms are actually giving rise to the diseases. And I'm I'm going to give you um just give you one example here. So now we look a little bit at disease in in old worms. So here's the front end of a of a of a young hermaphrodite. Um, so when they uh, when they get older, uh, among the pathologies they get is um, uh, you see these large um, oily pools which are filled with vitlogenins, with yolk. So they're sort of yolk, yolky, lipid-rich pools, um, uh, which is a rather sort of steatotic type of phenotype. And then here, this is um, uh, uh, what happens to the intestine. Um, so the intestine loses its biomass absolutely dramatically uh, over the first 10 days of adulthood. Very, very striking. Um, so again, I'm going to cut a long story short to cover a lot of ground here. Um, so uh, 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 as we reported back in, in 2018, um, we, uh, we uh, assembled a lot of data that all led to a, a particular model, which is that, um, in fact, so the intestine is the site at which the yolk is synthesized. Um, and what the data, the, what the data uh, implied is that actually um, the worm actually consumes its own biomass in order to keep yolk production going. And so um, what happens then is that, um, and this is, this is actually driven, this, this what we call a, a gut to yolk biomass conversion mechanism, is driven by insulin IGF signaling in the DAF2, it's totally prevented. It's also DAF16 dependent, uh, and it's also mediated by autophagy. So this pathology is actually autophagy dependent. You block autophagy, you, you can uh, inhibit quite strikingly, the, the development of the pathology. And so this is a, a mechanism to ensure more yolk production. And in later life, it runs on, it continues on, it becomes a quasi program. Um, so we were very excited about this at the time. We thought, well, okay, we've got an example here of, uh, of, uh, of an etiology, which is run on of this gut to yolk biomass conversion. It's a quasi program. So it's an example, it's sort of a, an illustration, another example of uh, the programmatic theory. Um, it's promoted by insulin and IGF signaling, it's suppressed by DAF16. Um, so it's an, it's an actual process of senescence at the end of DAF16. We were very, very excited about that. It seemed like we got to the bottom of the pathway, and to, to, at least to a degree. Um, all right, so now uh, there's a sort of change of gear in the talk. Um, because now I'm going to go into a sort of newer work, which gets weirder. And uh, and here, it, it's really funny trying to publish this stuff, because you, 
you get reviews very, very mixed. One reviewer will say, wow, that's totally weird. That's amazing. Really interesting. Another one will say, oh, this is totally horrible. This is rubbish. This is sort of nonsense. <laughs> totally hate it. It's, it's very funny. Um, so shocking new findings. I, I'm going to show you two. Um, so the first shocking new finding, uh, this is work from another uh, amazing postdoc, Karina Kahn, um, extraordinary, uh, uh, the extraordinarily creative uh, uh, researcher. So she, she started saying, well, so the older worms are, are accumulating yolk. Uh, could that be an adaptation? Now, these worms are, are post-reproductive. So the yolk accumulates after the sperm depletion. And, and uh, um, so um, it didn't seem very likely. But then what Karina noticed, and she was using um, a strain where, where you have one of the vitilogenins, VIT2, tagged with GFP, is that, um, is that yolk actually comes out through the vulva. And if you look on plates uh, with older worms, you see pools of, uh, of, of yolk on the plate. You see, that's how they look in Brightfield. There, there's a, and those are unfertilized oocytes full of yolk. Okay? So, uh, so Karina and I thought, well, m maybe the larvae consume the yolk. The, what the mothers are putting out yolk and the larvae consume it. So she characterized uh, that. Um, oh, here's a little movie here. So, so this shows um, yolk venting. From a, from a mother. So what we're going to see, if you look here, there's a pool here of GFP tag yolk, which is um, in the uterus here. Here's the vulva. So you watch what happens. This is a, a movie. Right? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Watch it. Let's see. It's moving a little bit. Okay, here it comes. There you go. See? <laughs> there you go. You see that they they they're venting yolk. They're, this is um this is probably a four day old um hermaphrodite. Um, so here's a bit of uh, bit of data. So this is just looking at this is egg. This is the age of the of the adults. Uh, this is egg laying. So the eggs run out, and then this peak. Uh, there's a peak of um, unfertilized oocytes, and there's also a peak of yolk venting. So so when they finished laying eggs, then you get the big peak of yolk venting. But they continue doing it until quite late. So Karina did some uh, really quite simple experiments to see whether the larvae grow better if they're given yolk. So these are um, plates with no E. coli, NGM plates. Uh, so you put the mothers on, the four-day-old mothers, uh, and you let them vent yolk, and then you put eggs on and see how, how the larval development is affected. So here we've got um, with yolk added, and this is with no yolk, so they're, they're growing bigger. Um, here we've got, as instead of no nothing on the plate, we put L3s on the plate as a sort of control for general things that the worms might secrete, and you see a, a growth benefit there. Um, this is a, a sort of cleaner experiment. Here we've got mothers uh, venting yolk, and then we've got mothers here venting yolk, but we treated the worms with RNAi to block vitilogenin synthesis. Okay, and they, they uh, grow significantly more slowly. And here's, in a way, the coolest experiment. This is um, what we do here is that we take the mothers who've just got a few eggs left, and we put them on the plate. We let them lay their eggs, and either we leave the mother or we take the mother away. So we leave the mother to, to synthesize yolk. And you can see here, if we take the mother away, they grow less well. And here, what we've done, instead of taking the mother away, we replace the mother with a surrogate mother of the same age who's been treated to knock out the yolk production. And you can see the advantage is, is lost again. So from that, we, we come to this conclusion, which is that the vented yolk functionally acts like a milk, right? It's a milk. Um, so, um, you know, a little bit more on this. So the insulinizer signaling pathway promotes the, uh, the yolk milk. We call it yolk milk uh, um, when, it, when it's secreted. Um, so, uh, so here we go. This is, um, this is, this is milk venting uh, that's normalized to one. And these are two DAF2 mutants. Um, uh, so it completely knocks it out. And then here we've got, uh, these are a couple of mutants where you've got Basically, increased insulin IGF signaling. That's a gain of function DAF2. That's DAF18, P10. Um, so then, OK, now, now we come to the conclusions. Um, so the worms seem to exhibit something which is the equivalent to lactation. And I was, um, when we first kind of came up with this conclusion, I was, uh, I was embarrassed about this because I thought it sounded silly. But then I talked to colleagues who said, no, well, you know, you get other invertebrates that produce milk, a tsetse fly, apparently. And uh, there's a Pacific be beetle cockroach that produces milk. So, you know, invertebrates do produce milk in, in, in this sort of way. And it's called milk as well. Some people say, oh, you can't call it milk. 
it's like a what is it no boobs no milk kind of argument um but i i would say functionally it's milk um so uh so the small shock and i i'm i'm perfectly at ease with this the conclusions of our earlier paper were wrong it's not a futile run on it's actually um, a trade off it's a reproductive cost right because it's not futile at all it's that the biomass conversion is actually functional um and um so okay we revised the conclusions of our earlier paper um but now it get, this is where it gets shocking and i'm going to slightly jump over things here just for, for time but um this type of process where organisms kind of um break down their own biomass in order to produce things for their offspring and destroy themselves in the process is characteristic of a certain type of life history which is called the semelparous life history this is like uh, particularly things like um like pacific salmon right they swim up river they they die in in the by, by, by they exhaust themselves and they destroy their own tissues completely they break them down and quite a lot of uh, of, of organisms who do reproductive death as it's called um do the same thing um, um monocarpic plants for example do the same um and uh, in fact um if you look across species if you look at organisms that have reproductive death if you block reproductive death you get huge increases in lifespan for example if you, if you castrate pacific salmon before the uh their, their um uh, uh, mating run instead of dying within weeks they'll live for another five years okay and in sea of course if you if you take away the germline you you uh, you suppress longevity um oh sorry you 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 cause a, a big increase in longevity so i think this raises a question that we've been working on for a while um which is that um that the longevity in celegans is actually uh maybe to some extent due to suppression of reproductive death and that's why you get these huge increases in celegans which you generally don't see anything of remotely the same magnitude in in other organisms um so this is the scary thing that this is this is the why the the japanese woman is screaming because um uh, could it be that this increase in lifespan that you see in DAF2 is because of suppression of reproductive death? Uh, we published a bunch of papers. We've just got a, I'm sorry, I, I, I wondered about whether to include all the data from this new paper, which is just uh, in, in press. But there's quite a lot of evidence for this. But I'm, I'm going to sort of, I, I want to cover more ground. Um, so um, it's nice publishing things like this. It, there was a, a whole lot of stuff on the internet, you know, uh, people were people were really uh, sort of either some of them were just you know amused and some of them were kind of bad tempered about it. And one of my favourites was this one. This is uh, Brittany Borovich. Microscopic worms pee milk on their children as their bodies decompose. So, so you know, it, you, it puzzled me for a minute, and then I thought, okay, so she doesn't know worm anatomy. Of course, we all know that worms pee out out of the ventral side of the head. So, um, so she was thinking they pee out, out of the through the through the vulva. Um, all right, so I've said something, you know, if it's true, I think you can make a strong case for this. Um, it's certainly something where it sh should seriously consider this as a possibility. Uh, if worms are actually dying from reproductive death, you know, should we aging, worm aging people sort of jump off a cliff? Because it's, you know, we don't, mammals and don't die from reproductive death as a rule, right? Humans, fruit flies, mice don't. It's something different. Um, so I don't think so. And this is a slightly complex argument. Um, but this is what we think. And this is some of this is based on a lot of sort of scholarly work looking at, uh, at uh, um, literature on, on, on life history and so on. So, um, so you have two different types of life history in animals and, and plants, uh, broadly speaking. You have the itraparous, where you have multiple rounds of reproduction, like in Drosophila and mouse and human. And then you have the semelparous, where you have a suicidal reproductive effort, as in Pacific salmon. Uh, and arguably in C. elegans. Um, but what we what we think is that, is that, so the question is, is it relevant? Is C. elegans relevant for understanding aging in higher animals? I think it probably is. And I think you, you can make a strong case that these two t types of life history are not completely separate. They're not, you know, they're not entirely different. And in fact, across nature, what you find is more of a spectrum between semelparous and itraparous life histories. Um, and uh, so here's an example of how you might see the relationship between them. So what we call this, rather than quasi-program, we, we call this a costly program. It's another programmatic mechanism of aging. 
Um, and in mammals, for example, mice and humans, um, during milk production, you have a costly program, which is that you get um, you get bone erosion. So the bone erodes during uh, during uh, lactation, um, and it causes transient uh, vulnerability to bone fracture. Um, but it's reversible because once once the, you stop nursing, the bone will grow back again. Whereas in uh, in C. elegans, with the with the yolk milk production, of course evolutionary there's a, there's a relationship between milk production and, and yolk production. Uh, you have uh, something very similar, costly program. So we've got benefit in green and and the harm in in red. In this case, it's irreversible. It's a runaway uh, costly program that leads to reproductive death. So they are related, I think. So I think. Um, it is relevant. I think we can learn about general mechanisms of aging, even though it's some of past. All right, now we've, uh, this is something, another thing, also shocking. This, this freaked me out. Again, I was embarrassed by this initially, and I had to talk to a lot of people to convince myself that it wasn't silly. And this, this was um, ideas, particularly from discussions with uh, Jennifer Law, an evolutionary biologist from Canada, and, and Evgeny again, very creative thinker he was. Right, so he, here's the starting point. Um, Oh, look at this, look at this. This is, um, this is uh, wild type worms, and these are age one mutant worms. These are, um, this is a gene in the, in the insulin I just signaled pathway. These worms live 10 times longer than wild type. So, you know, what does that mean? You, know, you can say, well, it means that there are some core mechanisms causing the whole process of aging, and uh, the age one is controlling that. But it's tempting, it's sort of tempting, and Cynthia Kenyon is completely takes this view, that actually it's a self-destruct mechanism in the worm, rather like apoptosis. It's a programmed death mechanism. Um, so I, for years and years, I, I thought that Cynthia Kenyon was just off, you know, she was just sort of with the fairies about this. I mean, it was crazy, just ignoring evolutionary theory. But actually, I think her instincts were kind of just supernaturally uh, good in this case. So this is going back to evolutionary theory of the 19th century. So, it, you know, does, is it good for, is, is aging a good thing? Does it promote fitness? And initially in the 19th century, the contemporaries of Darwin, they said, yes. So you basically, you have an old worn out individual and then they, uh, they die from aging. And that, that, that leaves more food for younger people who are reproducing and it's for the good of the species. So this was the old uh, 19th century theory, but this was poo pooed completely by 20th century evolutionary biologists, such as Williams, uh, who you know, argued uh, along with the, pretty much all of the evolutionary biology field that aging doesn't promote fitness. It's, it's to do with pleiotropic effects of genes whose action promotes fitness in early life. So no, it doesn't. And this, these conclusions were, were solidly proven through uh, a mathematical modeling and population genetics, this is Bill Hamilton, um, who showed, demonstrated that uh, if you uh, in dispersed outbred populations, selfish individuals that remained alive would outcompete aging altruists. So it's a problem to do with the evolution of altruism. You'd never, it would always be better to stay alive rather than to sacrifice yourself for the species. But this actually changed, and this is a sort of convergence of things where, in fact, the, I realized from, from talking to various people that the premise of, of Hamilton here probably doesn't apply to C. elegans, as shown relatively recently, particularly by uh, Marion Felix's work, you know, that in the wild, the C. elegans are, are probably largely existing as, 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 as non-dispersed uh, uh, populations because they're on food patches, uh, and they're to a large extent clonal. I mean, they're not entirely clonal, there's a lot of clonality among them. So in that situation, that changes the whole, uh, the whole rules. And let me just sort of illustrate why the, the um, the idea of, of, of colonial C. elegans and, and uh, what you call viscous populations is so critical here. More theory, sorry about this. Um, so if you have a, um, so here's the idea. If you have an, here's an altruist, okay? An altruist uh, uh, organism. It, it dies, it kills itself. It loses its own personal fitness, but it increases the fitness of its kin, right? So it's, in, it's increasing what you call inclusive fitness. Uh, and then you have, here's a selfish individual uh, which doesn't commit suicide and it just stays alive. Um, and then it, it, it there's, there's, has the benefit of increased personal fitness. So again, red, bad, green, good. So now what happens if we have a, this is, this is the Hamilton situation. You've got a dispersed outbreeding population. 
Here are the, the, the nice altruists. Here are the egotists in gray, look, you see. So the altruists, they kill themselves and they leave more food. The, the egotists just eat it all up, you see. Yeah? Um, and so in the end, what happens, of course, the egotists will, will, will outbreed the altruists. But supposing you have viscous populations like this, right? These are non-dispersed. So here we have colonies of egoists and colonies of altruists. Uh, and you can see the altruists do better, right? Because there's no parasitizing from the egotists. It's interesting. It's very political. Um, so, um, so to summarize, and I, there's a lot of theory here. And if you can look at particularly, this is a, a review of this in, in, uh, from uh, uh, 2019 that really lays this out in detail. So it's possible in principle, right? There's no proof here. It's possible in principle. The evolutionary theory allows that it could be that adaptive death happens in C. elegans. Um, there might be conditions in which it, it can happen. I mean, that's a, that's a complex question. Um, it's conceivable that insulin just signaling is actually increasing fitness by promoting programmed adaptive death. It is possible. And I'd never realized that before. 2019. Um, and in fact, there's quite a lot of self-destructive traits in C. elegans that don't make a lot of sense. Hard to make sense of them, but they do make sense in the light of possible adaptive death. And this, this holds for C. elegans. But this is not, this is purely for colonial, clonal organisms like yeast, bacteria, uh, dictyostelium, for example. Um, it does not apply to humans, does not apply to mice, does not apply to fruit flies. Um, so um, it's very difficult to test. Evgeny did a wonderful study where he built a, an in silico model where he, um, you know, he had food patches and, and worms with different uh, uh, um, uh, lifespans and different uh, brood sizes and so on. And, and he was able to show that under some conditions, you can, uh, you can, you can actually improve colony fitness by having a, um, a shorter lifespan. Um, you know, in a way, was sort of proving what we believed. So it wasn't, you know, I wasn't so excited about that. But the way the model behaved was fascinating. It showed all sorts of other features um, where to make sense of why colony fit. So we're measuring colony fitness in terms of dower yield. Right? So we're kind of, in a way, we're thinking about, so here's the worm life cycle. And in a way, we have a life cycle of a colony as well, right? And so in a way, we're, this, this is coming towards a, a kind of a, like a group selection argument. Where the where you've got selection of colonies, you've got, in other words, you've got com competition between between colonies, and in a way, the Taoists then become uh, equivalent to the eggs, right, of the individual. Um, and then it, it, the 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 model, the behavior of the model suggested that there are various different ways that the um, uh, that you can optimize population structure to ensure that as much as much of the food as possible is turned into into Taoists, which are your in a way the equivalent of the eggs in the life cycle. So what the uh, what the paper sort of supported, um, at least you know as far as that goes, it's not real worms, is the is the presence of trade-offs between fitness at the level of individual worms uh, and and uh, fitness at the level of the colony. So you can have trade-offs that reduce fitness of the individual worms, but actually increase fitness of the of the uh, colony. I think it's a interesting new perspective. All right, so. Some of you might be thinking, well, this is a bit confusing because I'm talking about reproductive death, worms showing reproductive death that they're like Pacific salmon. And then I'm saying that they've got adaptive death. So, you know, which is it? And I was bothered by this. Um, but then I realized that, um, and this again was working with Evgeny, uh, and this is set out in, a, in an article in the uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, um, that in fact, you can make a very good argument that, that of, of, of um, co-evolution of reproductive death and, um, and adaptive death. And that's particularly because, well, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so, uh, so here's the model. So we've got reproductive effort, uh, you've got increased fitness, um, and then you've got increased mortality. So this is from, for example, from, could be from something like biomass conversion of gut. Um, and then um, you also then have a further evolution of adaptive death um, to, uh, uh, to basically improve food availability for for, uh, for reproductive forms. So this is a form of adaptive death that we call consumer sacrifice. And in fact, uh, so uh, yeah, this is the, the theoretical point, is that um, the fitness cost to organisms who've, who, who are un undergoing reproductive death of then having a programmed uh, um, adaptive death is zero. So it's very easy for uh, for adaptive death to evolve in the context of reproductive death. 
Uh, and in fact, salmon, and we made this argument and again in this paper, and it went through peer review and the evolutionary biologists seem happy with this. Uh, we made the argument uh, partly using data from, uh, from fish biologists that, um, that the same thing has happened in, in Pacific salmon. You, you have reproductive death, and there is actually also evidence of adaptive, of, of adaptive death in salmon, that the corpses are actually providing food for offspring. So we call this a biomass sacrifice form of adaptive death. So, uh, so I think in a way, you can see that in a way, the argument is that there's a, there's a sort of distant mirror between Pacific salmon and, and sea elegans in terms of their biology. Um, all right, so um, so where does this all lead? Um, all right, so I think um, this is what where we started. This is what I thought when I started work on this and worked on this for many years, this sort of model, that it's all working through molecular damage causing aging. And then uh, more recently, we came up with this notion uh, with, you know, the, using the programmatic theory that we have programmatic mechanisms um, which maybe are not causing the whole of aging. They're probably just causing multiple senescent pathologies. And this is, again, in worms and flies and mice. But then if we're talking about reproductive death and adaptive death, this is not present in worms and flies. Oh, sorry, uh, flies and mice. This is something peculiar to C. elegans. But then, okay, that, but on the other hand, this is an unsatisfying model because we know that um, insulin IGF signaling does have effects on aging in worms and flies. So it can't be all reproductive death and adaptive death. Um, so how do we, how can we explain all this in terms of a single model? Um, right, what I just said. Okay, so here's, here's the model. So in worms, we have something that looks like this. We have something, they behave as if there's this upstream aging process um, causing everything. Um, but in our higher organisms, I would argue, um, the evidence isn't really there for that. It's not so clear. And when you look at the effects of, uh, of these mutations that extend lifespan on pathology, uh, they're more consistent with a, a mixed model where you have various things contributing to aging. And what you've probably done with some of these interventions that extend life um, is to actually uh, um, uh, affect these, what you could call etiologies of senescent multimorbidity, right? Like, uh, like this, for example. Um, so then here we've got DAS16 controlling this, but maybe actually what we have is DAS16 uh, 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 preventing reproductive death and adaptive death. So, um, so that's a model. So in a way, you know, thinking back, going back to the, the 90s and when I got excited about this, I mean, it's, a bit, it's a bit disappointing in a way, if this is correct. And it reminded me of when I was um, a little boy, I used to read, you know, uh, things like um, the Green Lantern and Flash and Batman and things like this. And when I was very small, I didn't realize that they weren't real, you know, real people. They, re they didn't really exist. And I can remember when I started to realize that they weren't real. And uh, initially, I, I reasoned that probably things like Superman and the Fantastic Four weren't real. But Batman, you know, he, he seemed more plausible. Maybe Batman really did exist. Um, but then, you know, I, I quickly realized that he wasn't real. So, um, you know, this idea of, of tapping into this central aging, sort of powerful aging mechanism that would prevent all diseases of human aging in the same way, I think, I'm afraid it probably isn't real, which is in a way rather, rather sad. In, but instead, you know, what we have is understanding. Um, so I think my sense at the moment is that the, the, the prospects of radical interventions to slow aging are less good than they were by a long way. But the prospects for understanding aging have gotten a lot better. Um, and in a way, that's, that's what we can definitely achieve with C. elegans, is to, is to get to this understanding of aging. So what I'm going to do finally, um, oh, I've really gone over there. I see the red light. OK, all right, three minutes all I need, I think. Um, Sorry about that. Um, I didn't even notice the lights. So I think I was po pointing the other way. So during the lockdown, um, I did quite a lot of work uh, with, with folks uh, developing a, a, a sort of a, like a, an advanced model uh, based on the programmatic theory, which is a multifactorial model, which I think is, I just think this is really interesting and exciting. So it's, it's actually uh, something that begins to uh, show capability of, of being able to explain specific diseases of aging. We, and we've been testing it on, 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 we've been using it to try to develop such models. 
So here's how it works, okay? So this is thinking very, very high up, broad brush. What causes disease? That might seem a silly question in a way. You say, well, so many things. But actually, many of the diseases of early life, they share a basic feature, which is that they involve disruption of normal function, okay? So that would include things like um, path in in sorry, infection with pathogens like viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and so on, or mutation, or uh, 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 mechanical injury, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, the, the multifactorial model argues that diseases of aging are all highly multifactorial in terms of their cause. There are different ways to, to, to produce them. Um, so di this disruption in, in aging itself has two major causes. And this is one of them. Th th this contributes to aging, right? Um, it plays a role. And it also affects mean lifespan. It will affect the differences between us, for example. It will be mainly to do with differences in this. But aging, what's new and different about aging is it has this second box, which is the wild type genotype and phenotype. Um, and this is what controls maximum lifespan of a species. This is why we live twice as long as a chimpanzee, for example, our, our species lifespan. It's controlled through this, not this. But both of them work together to cause disease. And as an example, there's something like um, the SARS caused by uh, coronavirus. Um, People who die from SARS, people who die from coronavirus infection are largely elderly. And they die because they have um, uh, senescence of the immune system. They develop cytochrome storms in response to, to viral infection. So in a way, uh, the, the, most of the deaths from coronavirus are in a way diseases of aging. They, they won't happen without the, um, without the virus, but it takes the two things together to produce the disease. The wild type genotype, where does the bad stuff come from here? It's coming from the evolutionary process. The evolu evolutionary process provides the explanation for why uh, the, the wild type genotype um, is causing uh, all this disease. And that's very much what my lab is, is, has been, is focusing on at the moment, is developing more uh, deeper accounts of how this is happening, which I don't really have time to go into today. So I, I'm going to skip over the next. So this is Jekyll and Hyde quality of, of antagonistic plantrophy uh, genes. All right, I'm going to skip over there. So just, just to let you know that this, in case you're interested, this uh, account is laid out in detail in the theory. This is just uh, in more detail about the theory. And these are various people that have contributed to the development of the theory. Okay, so um, just to thank the people in my lab very much, uh, particularly that I talked about today, um, Karina Ken, who, who's done a lot of the amazing work on, uh, uh, on reproductive death and adaptive death from Evgeny Galimov and, and Jennifer Law. Uh, and thank you very much for um, for listening. The, the, the red one came on first, I think, and then the blue one. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your Oh, talk. wow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, okay, then. Take my water. So, okay. um, after listening to your talk, I have to tell you I totally dizzy. Um, Sorry, wh wh where are you? It's me. Uh, hello. <laughs> I'm very dizzy now about all your dizzy. But, yeah, <laughs> but I love it. I'm uh, glad because uh, people react well, the one way or the I think it's a sort of like a progressive reactionary thing. I know. Right? So, I reactionary know. people say, oh, so <laughs> or they say, oh, wow, that's uh, cool. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. But on the other hand, I'm, 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 I mean, we are really glad that you accepted uh, our invitation to come here. Uh, so this is what, what I had in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, some, some of these worms or people, I mean, die when they get older. It's because many of these um, uh, defense mechanisms like uh, DNA repair or stress response, autophagy, uh, just wear off, just go. Right, and and partly it's because some of these genes, I mean, are mis-expressed. Uh, so is is that true? Right, and so and I, I think I, I think um, I, I, is that true? I, I can't say, but I think what the what the programmatic theory the, the, the programmatic theory offers an alternative way of looking and understanding where how things go wrong, right? Um, so the traditional view, which is sort of like tattooed onto the brain of everybody in the aging field, is that sort of it's all to do with damage, you know. And the the focus on autophagy, I think, is very much 
I, I, I regard it as something of a relic of, of, of that because it's a sort of autophagy getting rid of damage. Um, the question is really, the question here is really what's actually initially causing things to happen. I mean, the damage, oxidative damage you get during aging massively, but it's generally a downstream consequence of the development of pathology. So for example, something like autophagy, um, there's a, you know, one that there's sort of a, it's what we in the lab is sometimes called the shit happens model, where it's just sort of, oh, it just happens. It just sort of breaks down. You know, the autophagy just sort of stops working, right? Uh, and that in a way is very unsatisfying because it's like a causeless, you know, account. Whereas the, what the programmatic theory would say, okay, look at what might be causing the regulation, regulatory changes that lead to autophagy being switched off. And then you might start having problems, for example, with protein aggregation because autophagy has been downregulated for some reason, right? So in a way, the cause is the problem isn't protein aggregation, really. The problem is that something has switched autophagy off, and that may be a programmatic mechanism. So what these theories are doing is really offering a completely different way of thinking about things, so, so, right? And I mean, it's, I've done that because I, I spent 20 years working with looking at, you know, DAS16 gene products and testing the damage theory and so on, and just getting absolutely nowhere. Whereas this is just like a, it's like opening a window and having massive fresh air coming. It's wonderful. You see what I mean? So I think, you know, it's damage, probably damage, like the random damage kind of machine model undoubtedly plays some role in aging. And I think what's beautiful about the multifactorial model is that it allows for that. So for example, cancer as an aging related disease, uh, to some extent, random damage is playing a role in that, although to some extent it may also be something coupled to cell division. But there's clearly a role there. But a lot of other aging-related diseases, I think it's very doubtful that the primary driver is really, really damage accumulation. Yeah. Uh, is there another question? Yes, Alejandro. Maybe... Well, it might be a puncture question regarding your organismal death studies. Yeah. It's not clear to me how does the intestinal necrotic wave relate to uh, the functioning of or the cessation of function of the nervous system? Ah, yeah. well, we don't know that at all. We don't know about the role of the nervous system in it at all. We, I mean, we've essentially just um, observed, I mean, it's very basic observations about the role of, of necrotic, cell necrotic processes in the uh, in the intestine initially in 2013, and then more recently in the musculature, and, and that seem to be closely coupled. So it's really we've we've hardly scratched the surface of that, you know. And maybe if I mean another short one, like a uh, bulb bursting. Do you What's think uh, the dead dead by bulb bursting as a cause of mortality? Do you Sorry, think that is also when the oh, bulb bursting? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that is? Um, it seems. I'm not a specialist, but is, this could be something that is maybe not so age related, or what is your? Uh, it's an odd one that one normally sees that in so, some mutants do it, and it's very often cold sensitive effect. You get it at low temperatures, and it's it happens at kind of over a long period in a fairly random sort of way, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. We haven't really looked at whether whether it's sort of how it relates to other aging pathologies and. Is it, isn't it sensor usually? Like... What's that? Sensor. Well, uh, yeah, that's, it's always tricky when you get that. Because I think what you have to do is that you have to, uh, you have to kind of log the ones that have undergone uh, the, the rupture phenotype. And then you have to do the survival analysis with them in or with it censored. I think that's the only way. Because you, you, you don't know what's right. But that's usually the safe way. You just look at it, look at it in both ways. Hey. There's another question, hey, Diego. Whether the what, sorry? Yoke, yeah. Oh. Ah, right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, there's lots of work going going back quite a long way about that. There's some work from um, Kathy Walcott from some years ago where uh, she showed that the, um, the, the, the uh, synthesis of the vitlogenin is controlled by insulin IGF signaling. And it's, it's controlled at the level of mRNA, but it's controlled also at the level of translation. The, 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 the frequency of the mRNAs for vitlogenin is incredible. I mean, actually, in, in those older worms, you end up with uh, something like 40% uh, of all the protein in the worm is actually vitlogenin. 
So that's very strongly regulated by internalizer signaling. And in, in the DAF2 mutants, gone. And also the, the atrophy in, in the stronger mutants like the E3070, the gut atrophy is completely gone. Okay. Thank you very much, David, for your wonderful talk. Can I say 